Monty was preparing for Operation Goodwood when a Spitfire targeted a German staff car carrying Rommel on the 17th of July in 1944, and Monty launched Goodwood the next day as soon as Rommel was presumed dead because the pilot had sworn that he watched the car flip over. Goodwood would end on the 20th of July when Hitler was supposed to be assassinated in his wolf's lair. But not only did Hitler survive, so did Rommel. When Monty discovered that Rommel had survived the Spitfire strafing the day before Goodwood launched, the British withdrew from their Orna bridgehead before dawn on the 18th so that bombers could drop 5,000 tons of high explosives on the village of Cagney, followed by British artillery and more bombers hitting ten other French towns. And because all of the dust and smoke because of all the dust and smoke from the bombs, the planes were unable to properly identify their targets, so some were not bombed while others not on the list were hit, and twenty-five of the bombers were shot down, but they missed the hospital where Rommel was being treated. As soon, it was, as, soon as it was confirmed that Rommel was still alive, Monty launched Operation Gaff, on the 25th of July by sending six British SAS commandos into France by parachute to kill Rommel, having obtained a complete picture of his movements from previous spy missions. And on the 28th of July, the GAF hit team was told that Rommel was dead and GAF returned to England. The reports written by GAF showed how easily British spies were able to move around completely undetected in France despite the German occupation. But that was no surprise because the SAS secret commando squads or special air services would dress in German uniforms while operating in France. Monty had signed an order dated the 20th of July that read, To kill Rommel would obviously be easier than to kidnap him, and it is preferable to ensure the former rather than to attempt and fail in the latter. Kidnapping would require successful two-way walkie-talkie communication and therefore a larger party, while killing could be reported by pigeon. Goodwood was supposed to make it appear that the Germans were unstoppable, so that making peace was in everyone's best interest, and a deal could now be made because Hitler was dead. And when Hitler miraculously survived the Stauffenberg bombing on the 20th of July, Monty came up with a new plan on the 24th of July called Operation Spring, and he sent a copy to the Americans, and a copy was received by the Germans. Spring described the British doing a quote-unquote holding attack, while the Americans were doing their Operation Cobra. And Monty told Hitler that Spring could not fail, that the Americans would be defeated for certain this time, and to prove Monty's loyalty to the peace proposal, the British would bomb the Americans at the opening of Cobra. Goodwood was supposed to have ended the war days before the Americans could commence Cobra, and if the Americans would have refused to go along with Monty's separate peace, then the Germans would put an end to the Americans once and for all during Cobra. As it happened, when the young German soldiers heard about the attempt on the life of their beloved Hitler on the 20th of July, they began to surrender to the Americans in droves, and as they surrendered, scores of British Thunderbolts and RAF Typhoons moved in to decimate them from the air. The British press was very gloomy after Cobra and reported that the Americans had not followed Monty's orders, and the British newspapers printed stories about American overcaution and cowardice, and they wrote that the Americans had intentionally slowed down so more Russians would die on the Eastern Front. At high noon on the 4th of July in 1944, every American gun let go in salute, and General Bradley said that it made France resound in a clap of thunder, after which Bradley began denying Monty the use of American troops. Monty's new Operation Spring would not only have won a Churchill-Hitler alliance in a separate peace, but would win an Anglo-Franco union for the British Empire, making the King of England also the King of France, 
while the Germans could keep their low countries and the Scandinavias, and the Americans would be sent back to the United States with their tail between their legs, but only after using them as mere mercenaries against the Russians, and war reparations from the damage done to France and Germany would be paid for by America. The success of Operation Spring would leave the British Empire the ultimate winner and penultimate overlord sharing the world with their Germanic cousins, and right before Cobra, the British newspapers began a campaign against the Americans, and this propaganda would continue right up until the very end of the war. The British trusted that the Russians would happily attack Americans, provided that the Americans ever managed to reach Germany at all and then America would be forced to fight the Russians, and after a little while the British could intervene to cut Russia a deal, if only they would agree to overthrow Stalin and restore the Russian royal family to the throne. After a day of clearing away their dead following the Cobra bombing, the Americans went forward to find that word of mouth had gotten around to the German soldiers that Hitler had tried to murder Rommel three days before half the German generals had tried to kill Hitler five days ago, and in disgust, German soldiers in front of Cobra started surrendering en masse to the Americans in honor of Rommel and in sympathy for Hitler. But Monty needed them to fight the Americans rather than surrendering, and many young Germans who had abandoned their arms to surrender were massacred by land and by air by the British. With the failure of Operation Valkyrie and Goodwood, Patton was allowed by Schaeff to come over to France, and despite Patton finally being freed to come to Normandy on the 1st of August, Monty continued to be in charge of doling out supplies while the port of Cherbourg was getting farther and farther away from the front lines as the Americans marched towards Germany. And Monty had hoped the Americans would get stuck in Paris, that the soldiers would run amuck in a party atmosphere liberating Paris, but Ike refused to go there and called it just another prestige objective. The idea was that the Americans would stay busy feeding the French in Paris long enough for Monty to do his Operation Market Garden, and as a favor to the French, Ike allowed Patton to liberate Paris on the 25th of August, but Patton ordered his troops to parade straight through without leave or liberty because the soldiers had learned to pronounce Rambouillier. Leclerc's 2nd Armored Division showed up the day before Patton's ground army arrived so the French could take credit for setting Paris free, and Ike had no choice but to go along with Market Garden because supplies from... Operation Dragoon, an American landing in the south of France, would not reach Patton until the 12th of September, and that meant the British were still in charge of do doling out supplies from the Normandy beachhead under Monty's command from his headquarters at Cannes. The problem of supplies had been exacerbated by secret British SAS squadrons sabotaging railway lines and selectively bombing trains to prevent supplies from reaching the Americans, but the Red Ball Express was succeeding in a way the British could not have imagined, and the Red Ball was driven by American soldiers of African descent eager to prove their worth so they would emerge as victors when they went back home to America to tell their story, making them the true heroes of saving America in France during 1944. And FDR had signed Executive Order 8802 back in June of 1941, making it illegal to discriminate against Americans of African descent when money from the government was involved, and that had fired up the Red Ball Express. The American soldiers of African descent were helped by the love the French population had for them, which was a surprising and welcome contrast to how they were being treated in America, and slavery had ended up being the most successful immigration device in American history, as there were two Africans in America, for every one Irishman, one Briton, one Scot, one Frenchman, one Spaniard, one Norwegian, one Russian, one Pole, one German, one Hungarian, one Italian, one Chinaman, one Japanese, one Indo-Chinese, one Arab, and one Native American Indian. In 1912, 
Thirty percent of Americans had been foreign-born, and the draft for the Great War had created a melting pot of national identity, and in the draft for Hitler's war in 1942, fifty percent of American soldiers had failed the fourth-grade reading and writing test, while so many failed the physical test that some wondered if Hitler wasn't right after all. But since FDR himself was physically challenged, he had empathy for the disadvantaged and believed in their potential, and he would not be disappointed. After the war, Mrs. Roosevelt would carry forward FDR's plans to improve American schools. An American doctor of African descent figured out how to store blood in 1940 by separating the red cells from the plasma, and blood could now be banked that would save countless lives during Hitler's war, and Dr. Drew spent a year in England showing them how it worked, and then he went on to teach surgery at Howard University. When Patton became old blood and guts of the Third Army, he had an orderly of African origin who packed and carried his bags, while the British requested that no soldiers of African descent be allowed in the presence of British officers. The British hated the familiarity of Americans with their servants and despised the heraldry of the American common man, and they pointed to the unequal treatment of the descendants of Africans as a step in the right direction. When the British met America's Buffalo soldiers during Hitler's war, they discovered that the most ill-treated American of African descent was better off than the luckiest common Englishman. <laughs>